Say amen while you're being seated. It's good to see you this morning. Happy Resurrection Day. You know, the ancient church had a way of greeting, kind of lost its uh, deal here in the last few years. It's been replaced by something else. You say, what else? Well, here, here's the greeting a lot of people go by today. You finish it for me. God is good. All the time. God is good. Let's try it again. God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. It used to be like this. He is risen. And the reply would be, he is risen indeed. So let's try that. He is risen. risen That was almost good. How about again? He is risen. risen Yes, he is. And praise the Lord for that. And because that we can celebrate and because that we have life. Well, welcome to the fourth of our services this morning. We had two in Magnolia campus and two here today. And thanks to Brother Tim preaching over there and Brother Gary preaching the early service here. Uh, allows us to minister to more folks on Easter Sunday morning. We're just glad you're here and you've chosen to worship with us. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We've titled our sermons today, Experiencing Easter. If you've got a card in the mail, perhaps, that's what it said, Experiencing Easter. Because it is more than just a story of resurrection, Jesus. You know, it's a story that we can experience resurrection life ourselves. There's a passage in Acts chapter 2. If you'd like to stand for the reading of the word, I think I have this little thing in my pocket. There we go. It's a miracle. Like, wasn't an Easter egg. Praise the Lord. (laughs) This man, delivered up by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, you nailed to a cross by the hands of godless men and you put him to death. Well, let me go back. I'm going to get ahead of myself there. Second verse. And God raised him up again, putting an end to the agony of death since it was impossible for him to be held in its power. Amen and amen. You may be seated. What a great verse about the power of God to raise up the Lord Jesus Christ's body. We know that he went to the cross and we, we know that he died for our sins there and we know that he was buried But we also know the power of the resurrection story that the Gospels give us. Being raised by the power of God. Being raised by the power of the Holy Spirit. It's a great testimony. It's written all throughout the New Testament. Understand the cross of Jesus Christ is glorious. It did give us what we needed to pay for our sins. But listen, the cross without the resurrection simply kind of shows us that there was one that was rejected by men. And if you look at it clearly, he was accused by God. Say, how do you mean? He paid the price for our sins. The Bible says our sins were laid upon Jesus Christ. If it had not been for the the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, then you and I would be left to die in our sins. But he took our place on the cross. But God proves his acceptance of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ by raising up Jesus from the dead. That shows us that the sacrifice that was presented on our our behalf, was presented and accepted by God. But without the resurrection, how do we know that? Without the resurrection, all of of Christianity pretty much rises or falls. If the resurrection is not true, then we really have no hope. The apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, he said, listen, if Christ is not risen from the dead, we are foolish men. We believed a lie and we speak a lie. But we also know that Christ is risen from the dead. And because he is risen from the dead, we have something to stand for. Of course, we're living in a world of skeptics, but that's been that way for ever since Jesus rose from the dead and before he even was born of a virgin, there's been skeptics. But the skeptics specifically like to aim their guns at the resurrection of Jesus Christ It's always at this time of year you get those stories on ABC and National Geographic who want to talk about the life of Jesus, and many of them kind of leave you hanging about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I I watched one last night just briefly before going to bed. It's called The Killing Killing of Jesus, and it ended pretty much with Peter sitting in a boat on the Sea of Galilee with his fish in that out kind of looking up to heaven, and all of a sudden he gets, he's got fish in his net, and he's praising the Lord. Well, that's not the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is that Jesus appeared to Peter while he was on the Galilee and fishing, and he's the one who reminded him, try the other side. <laughs> and then his net was full, and he looks up and says, it's Jesus, and he swims to the shore to see Jesus. He's risen from the dead. 
Our faith is not in vain and the story is not in vain. And all, yes, skeptics have aimed their biggest guns at the resurrection of Jesus and have con continually failed in disproving the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ has been examined more carefully than any other historical event and examined by some of the greatest minds and scholars that the world has known. One such was Simon Greenlee. If you're not aware of who that is, he was a royal professor of law at Harvard University from 1833 to 1848. In fact, he's the one who pretty much started Harvard and brought it to preeminence, especially as a school of law. He was one of the greatest legal authorities uh, concerning evidence in the history of the world. In fact, his volume, a three-volume series of books and commentaries are studied to this day is on laws as he looked at the evidence and the, uh, how evidence works and the authority of presenting evidence as legal proof in a court of law. He still studied to this day. And looking for evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ became one of his greatest works as he sought to disprove or prove through the evidence presented did Jesus really rise from the dead or is that mythological? He concluded it was a reality and a true historical event. His conclusion was anybody that would honestly examine it in the light of true evidence would certainly conclude the same things. It was also Frank Morrison, who was a British attorney, who set out to disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ and renounce the resurrection. He also, as an attorney, took time to examine all the evidence. And as a skeptic, he was converted. He was overwhelmed by the evidence. In fact, he wrote a book himself that was titled, Who Moved the Stone? The first chapter of that book was entitled, The, the Book That Refused to Be Written. But it, he couldn't disprove it. Lou Wallace was another. In fact, Lou Wallace, that was just a, he had a, a that was a surname for writing books. He, he it came to this as a skeptic as well, wanting to disprove the deity and then also subsequently the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lou Wallace concluded that Jesus did come. He was the son of God and he died for our sins and he rose from the dead. In fact, instead of writing a book to disprove it, he write, wrote a book uh, uh, called, maybe you're familiar with it, became a movie, Ben-Hur, about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Josh McDowell was another skeptic who thought he could just disprove the resurrection, but that as he sought and studied for a long time about how he could disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ, he also wrote a book called Evidence and got converted in the process, Evidence that Demands a Verdict. There have been others. There's a recent movie that came out based upon the story of a, a, a Chicago Tribune editor and writer named Lee Strobel, The Case for Christ, where he shares his testimony and his story about his journey to disprove Jesus' deity and his resurrection, but he couldn't. And he ends up giving his life to the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Those are just a handful of the thousands of people who've done the same thing. I think we do well to conclude what the Bible concludes with in Acts chapter 2 when it says that God has raised up Jesus from the dead. Listen, this morning, I've got good news. God raised up Jesus from the dead. He gave his life and God raised him up. And he was raised by the power of God. Easter morning, we celebrate a risen Lord raised up for us. God raising him through his authority and his might and his majesty and giving him a life for all of us. God brings Jesus back to life. His dead body lay in the tomb. Not the fainting out, not passing out, as the book of Quran might say. Not the disciples stealing him away in the middle of the night. Jesus died and rose, revived for us, the Bible says, so that we can have life. The, the, the resurrection of Jesus is, doesn't stop there. If you study the Bible, you see that the resurrection power of Jesus was to be experienced. That's why we title this Experiencing Easter today. It was an experience for you and I to be had. The Apostle Paul in teaching in the New Testament obviously is going back over and over to the fact that not only did Jesus rise from the dead, but we can have life because of that resurrection power. As we give our lives to Christ, the Holy Spirit of God comes into us. The life of Christ flows into our lives and we experience a resurrection of our own. Paul wrote about this in Romans chapter six when he said this, do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Therefore we've been buried with him through baptism into death 
so that in order that as Christ was raised from the dead to the glory of God the Father, so we too might walk in the newness of life. In a nutshell, he's saying, we've been placed in Jesus Christ. That's what that word baptized means, to immerse into something. He said, because of what Christ has done, he's died for our sins, we now have life with Christ. And so he's come into us, but we've entered into his life as well. So we've experienced death because Jesus died for our sins. We have died to our sins, but not, it doesn't stop there. We have been raised to live in a new life. In other words, the resurrection power of Christ comes into our life when we give our hearts to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We experience a resurrection of our own. That's why I wrote the Corinthian church and said, if any man is in Christ, he's what? He's a new creation. All things have passed away. All things have become new. The beauty of Jesus Christ is not only that he comes as the Son of God, incarnate deity, full of beauty and glory, but he gives that glorious life for us. We can receive life now because he gave his life. But we also have this new resurrection life. You know, there's a verse I think that even the pagans know anymore. It's been advertised so much. John 3, 16, for God so... That was just beautiful. Give yourself a hand. I wasn't saying you were a pagan, by the way. <laughs> but isn't it interesting? But catch the last of that, that we have life, that we have eternal life. Now, that doesn't happen the moment I lay down in death, all right? That happens the moment I give my life to Christ, the newness of life that we have everlasting life. The moment a person surrenders their heart to Christ, they have everlasting life. In that instant, your life has changed. You become a new person. You're raised now to walk in the newness of life. What am I saying? You experience the resurrection yourself. You experience Easter yourself. The great God of glory and might comes and changes your life. What a wonderful Savior. What a beautiful Savior. Let me read you just a quote by, a, in fact, it comes from a daily devotional written by a Puritan back in the 1800s by the name of, of James Smith, and I think he was a Puritan. I'm just, I'm making that statement, so if you Google me later, let me know. <laughs> he said this, Jesus, listen to his description here, who died for thy sins is worthy to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. We can never ascribe too much to Jesus. He is worthy also to be believed in preference to Satan, unbelief, the world, or appearances, to be trusted with all, for all, and to be loved more than any other in opposition to any that would rival him. He's to be followed wherever he may lead us through evil report or good report, to be preferred to ease or pleasure, wealth or health, to anything and everything. Jesus is worthy to be our example, our confidant, our king, and our all. He is worthy of all he requires, all we can give, all his people have done for him or suffered in his cause. He is worthy. He's our king of glory. This morning as we celebrate Jesus and his resurrection, it's important not just to behold just who he is and all he's done for us, but it is to be experienced. Jesus didn't suffer the agonies of, of Calvary. He didn't undergo the Roman whip and the crown of thorns, the hatred, the spite of men, just to be honored in such a way that we are, well, let's say we become fans. We applaud what he's done. But he's, he did all he di did so that we could experience this new life in Christ Jesus. And I would say it again. Easter is to be experienced. You say, well, how then do we experience Easter? I'm going to give you just four real quick points this morning of how Easter becomes an experience in our life. And it starts first and foremost when we submit to his person, to the Lord Jesus Christ. There has to be this relationship that's established. You can't do it from afar. You have to come close to Jesus. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him come. There is a coming. There is a moving towards Jesus to become a disciple and to become a follower. Jesus isn't looking for a fan club. Jesus is looking for followers. Now, I know this morning, and I really want to be as honest as I possibly can with you about this message because this is the meat. This is the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we miss it, we miss everything. I think today, too many pastors and too many churches across the world 
are going to get up and preach an encouraging, as sweet a possible sermon as they, they possibly can with the hopes of, man, Easter's the big day, that you'll come back the following Sunday. And so, you know, it, it's kind of like handing out Shipley donuts for a sermon. They're sweet. They taste good. Not necessarily real good for you. Truth doesn't always taste as sweet until it's taken in. And then, as the Ezekiel said, it looked bitter, but when I tasted it, it became sweet as honey in my mouth. It may sound difficult. We talk about repentance, and we talk about, you know, a turning from our sins, and we talk about forsaking, or we mention hell. All those things have a harsh kind of edge to them. But when we receive the truth of God's Word, it is sweet to the soul, and it is too embraced in our lives. Amen? So rather than do something that might cause you to get fat this morning, let me just give you the meat of the gospel. Jesus is the Son of God. And Jesus is not looking for a fan club, and he's not looking for a bigger crowd next week. He's looking for those who would follow him as the Lord and Savior. Those who would desert one way of life to disciple and follow him in a completely new way of life. It's a call to come and die so that you can live. And far too often we forget that part. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, he must deny himself. All too often the sermons are kind of prepared and written and preached to help people be, I guess, think maybe feel better about themselves. We'll never really feel better about ourselves until we find ourselves in Jesus. And to find yourself in Christ means you turn from your old life and you turn from yourself and you turn from your sin. Jesus put it this way, if you don't repent, you will perish. Isn't it interesting as Jesus gathers the multitudes around him, he didn't preach little pretty little sermon, flowery, flowery little messages for everybody to walk up and say, oh, that was just so sweet. <laughs> That's not what he preached. He preached a life of surrender. He preached a life of commitment. He preached a life of following him, denying ourselves, putting others before ourselves, putting God first in our life, forsaking our, our selfish ways, loving those, loving our enemies. It calls for a life of desertion to my old way of living and commitment to this new way of living, which is following Jesus Christ. It's a, it's a matter of, will I submit myself to him as my Lord and Savior? Will I submit myself to him to follow him? A lot of people will deal with that issue, Savior, a lot, but we don't like to think about that word Lord too much because Lord, that kind of requires, let's use that dirty word for some, submission, you know, surrender to our lives. And he is Savior, but I, and I don't want to take away that. He's the only one who can save you. He's the only one who can forgive your sins. He's the only one who's going to get you into heaven, contrary to popular opinion today. He's the only way. He says of himself, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody's going to come to the Father but by me. He's Savior, folks. He's the Savior, but he's also the Lord. The Bible says when God raised up Jesus from the dead, he gave him a name above all names, that at that name, Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess to the glory of God the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Say it again. He is Lord. And I think sometimes people say, I like that Savior part, but I'm not so sold out on that Lord part. Well, the Lord part, if you miss it, you miss the saving part. In other words, Jesus is Lord. That's who he is. Jesus is Savior. That's what he does. Are you with me? Catch this. It's pretty simple. Because he is Lord, he can do what he does, save. If Jesus were not Lord, he would not have the power to save and to change our lives. But he is Lord. So you really can't have one without the other. All right. You're going to have to follow Jesus if you're going to know him as Savior in your life. That was the call he gave. And whether the crowds were massive or small, wherever he went and wherever he taught and wherever he preached, it was kind of like he divided them or decided them, you know. They either, it's either follow or forget. That's the way it always came out about with Jesus. It's, a, it's repent or be lost. That was his message. Why was it so, so, so strict, it seemed? Because any other way will mislead you. Any other way becomes a lie. He is the way. He is the truth. I remember when, uh, you know, we just had our own horrible, devastating hurricane here in, in Houston, but it didn't come because of the storm winds of the hurricane like so many places face when hurricanes came or come. It took place because of the, re the floods, waters, and the rains that just stayed over us for days, and it just kept raining and raining. Most of the times with hurricanes, just come in, boom, blow everything over, and leave with a little mild flooding here and there. 
Not so with Harvey. But one of those hurricanes that came into Florida and just devastated, remember several years back, was, 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 was Andrew. I don't know if you remember seeing all the pictures on TV after the devastation of Andrew. But I remember watching TV after Hurricane Andrew hit, the, hit, hit, hit Florida and just seeing homes, just miles of homes just laid flat, leveled. And it was just, I mean, my mind was just blown seeing the devastation of it all and seeing some of those aerial photos afterwards. But there was a reporter that was going through the streets in one of those communities in Florida. And he was going by, all these homes around were just falling down, and they stopped at one man's house, and his house was standing, and he's out front raking all the debris from his neighbors out of his house. And this reporter was just kind of in awe, and he said, sir, how come your house is standing, and all these other houses have completely blown away and been destroyed? He said, well, listen, first of all, when I moved in here, into Florida, I knew it was a problem, but I built this house myself because there was this problem like this. And he said, in fact, not only did I build this house myself, he said, I built this house according to the exact Florida code for this part of the state because it's hurricane prone. He said, in fact, when, when they said to use the, and when you build, put your roof on, you use the two by six trusses, guess what? I didn't use two by fours. I used two by sixes. When they said use the fasteners that fasten it down to the rest of the house and foundations, I used the fasteners that it called for. I built my house according to the code to withstand a hurricane. They told me if I built it this way, it'd handle it. I don't guess these other folks built according to the codes. <laughs> now there's a point I want to make out of that. All right. Which leads me to the second point here. When it comes to following Jesus, he has given us his word. If I'm going to really experience Easter in my daily life, I'm going to have to come to the place to surrender to God's word and see what it says about life and living. It's the code, all right? It's the word. In God's words are every principle for living your life that you could possibly imagine. On Wednesday nights, and we, as we rotate our teachers and preaching pastors around here, I've been preaching on Proverbs, and I've taken uh, probably two years now we've been in Proverbs. But one thing I've learned, 25 chapters of Proverbs that I've prepared and studied and poured over so far. we got 31, all right? So 25 that I have prepared so for, we've been going verse by verse and line on line, really searching out those scriptures. The Bible calls Proverbs the book of wisdom. I have discovered in those first 25 chapters, there's not one thing in my life that God hasn't given me a word about. It's just amazing how complete God's word is, how entire the scriptures are. The Bible says it's the inspired word of God and it's profitable for living as well as instruction and correction. All those. It's profitable to be your guidebook. It's not just God's book. It's your guidebook. And so in this guidebook, in God's word is, is, are the principles for every aspect of your life. Everything you'll ever face financially, maritally, raising kids. It's all there on your career. How to relate to people. It's just, it just pours out of that book, but it pours out of the whole book. God's word is complete. And what we need to do is to build our lives according to the word of God. This man says, I built my house according to the code and the standing. It reminded me of the parable of Jesus when he said, you know, there's a wise man and a foolish man. Both men built homes. He said, but one man built his house upon the sand, just built it right there on the ground. Another man built his house upon the rock. There's a foundation. He said, the man whose house was built upon the sand, when the winds came and the rains came and the floods came, and by the way, they come to all of us, winds, trying times, seems like you're just having to fight your way forward. The rains come, they just deluge. The floods come, you feel like you're just swimming to keep your head above water at times in life. Those all come. He said, the foolish man, he doesn't survive that. But the man who was wise and built his house upon the rock, when the winds came and the rains come and the floods come, that house will stand because it has a foundation. Now, the moral of the story, if you want to use that terminology, which Jesus gave us at the end of the parable, he says, the wise man is the man who built his house upon the rock. Well, the rock is my word. If you build your house upon my words, then your house is going to stand. 
when you build your life upon the Word of God, your life is going to stand. It's one thing for me or for you to experience the resurrection power of Jesus to save us, cleanse us, forgive us, give us new life. The power of, the, of God comes upon our life so that we can be changed, so that we can be different. But the way that we're going to experience that is we're going to have to surrender to the Word of God. If we miss God's Word, then we miss everything that God has for us. We need to embrace the truth of God's Word and live from the truth of God's Word. And in so doing that, we'll experience a life that when the storms do come, it doesn't blow us away. Now, I know, being pastor here, as long as I've been pastor, I've watched many of you and your lives. We've known each other, some of you, for a long time around here. Amen? But it's been interesting to sit back and watch how your lives have, have stood firm and how you have grown and against every odd of all the things that should have destroyed you, ruined you, I mean, decimated your life, you stood strong. You stood able to trust God. You stood in the worst of storms. You stood in the worst of the rains and the worst of the floods. And you've been faithful to God. And you've experienced what would have been a terrible curse upon your life, which had become for so many others, turned into a glorious blessing in your life because you held to the Word of God, because you believe the Word of God. Others, I believe, Christians even, they continue to fall, their homes continue to fail, their lives continue to fall apart because they won't come back to this simple truth. Jesus said, if you love me, if you love my words, then, I'll, then you'll abide in me. And when you abide in me, your life will be fruitful. The Bible talks about placing his word in us, living in his word, breathing his word, walking in his word, trusting his word. How can you live your life as a Christian and ignore the word of God? If you do, I don't know how well you're going to stand in the storms of life. Because the Bible, well, Jesus said, in this world, there's going to be tribulation. There's going to be problems. There's going to be issues. Jesus said, you build, my house, you build your house, you build your life on my word. How are you going to know what the desires of God are for your life? How are you going to know the will of God for your life? You're not until you get in to the word of God. You want to experience resurrection in your life daily? Then you experience the word of God in your life daily. Now, follow with me. This is kind of a flow that goes out of here, experiencing this resurrection power in our life. Because not only are we going to submit to his person and surrender to his word, out of this new life comes this, 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 this message of life, this message we call the gospel. Out of our lives, because we are following Christ, because we have been transformed, we are now the messengers of the gospel message. I mean, look through, this, look through the scriptures. Everywhere you go, Jesus is, is telling people, whether it's that guy who was filled with demons, you know, the maniac of the Gadarenes, we call him. He, he comes, as Jesus says to him, you go to the ten surrounding cities and tell them what God's done for you. Over and over, again, through the word, we see Jesus sending out people to tell what God has done for you. People call it witnessing. People call it evangelism. Hey, it's just doing what Jesus said do. His last two words were, go tell. <laughs> Isn't that simple? Go. Tell. Those are two strong verbs, all right? Going means we're living it. Telling means we're speaking it. Our lives speak it. Our lips speak it. We share the word of God. Resurrection morning. Those women, they come. Later, the disciples come. What's the message? They, when they see the two men standing there, go tell your brothers what the Lord has done. Go tell them that he's risen from the dead. It's still the message. It's, it's the same today. Jesus resurrected from the dead. 40 days he spent among his disciples and his followers, seen and witnessed by more than 400 different people. I mean, if you go into court one day and you want somebody to give testimony on your behalf, the best thing is to do to astound the judges and the lawyers bring in 400 people <laughs> who will give, who give the testimony. 400 people gave the testimony of Jesus' resurrection. But that's continues today through our lives. Jesus, as he ascends before those people, his last words from the angels are, Jesus has already told him to go and tell. He said, well, you man of Israel, why, why do you stand here amazed? You know, this same Jesus is going to come in a like manner. Let's get about what God's called us to do. Let's take the gospel to the world. Let's continue it. It's not good enough. People say, well, we've done that now. Listen, you know how many unbelievers are in the state of Texas alone? Millions upon millions of people who haven't even heard the gospel in our state, in our community, in our areas. How are they going to get it? Not by osmosis. Just you being in the room doesn't do it. Amen. That, that the whole thing where my life speaks, that, that, that's the osmosis effect. It doesn't work. All right? It works if you attach some words to it. You speak, you share, you tell. Good news is for sharing. I don't know, right? 
The gospel is a word that literally means what? Good news. I mean, you had some good news this week. I mean, somebody might have had a grandbaby. Somebody might have got a job. Somebody might have got, some of you got a new dress. You're kind of sharing the good news about it, you know. You put it out there on Facebook with all your other selfies, you know. <laughs> good news. We, just, we tell all the time. Good news. Let me tell you what's happening. Best news you'll ever be able to share is that Christ has changed your life. And that you're a new person in Christ Jesus. You're not what you used to be. God's done a work in your life. And you need to be experiencing that in your life. And I can guarantee you, if it is being experienced in your life, and out of your lips comes the truth of God's word, and you are sharing the good news. People, reaching people, sharing Jesus, we tell. I love the illustration I read about D.L. Moody. If you don't know who that is, he was a great preacher and evangelist out of Chicago, preached all over the world, changed thousands upon tens of thousands of lives. He was kind of the precursor to Billy Graham, all right? God used him mightily, but he was preaching in Chicago and he pastored there in Chicago. But one day he said, I was out sh- just to share the gospel with people and I'm walking down the street and there's a man who's leaning against a lamppost and I walked up to the man and I put my hand on his shoulder and he turned around angrily and, you know, raised his fist and said, let me go mind my own business. Moody's reply was great. He said, excuse me, sir, I didn't mean to offend you, but this is my business. <laughs> it is our business. It's our life to share the gospel. It's our right. Why is it our right? So you have the right to talk to me. You have the right to talk to everybody. Why? Because God told you to. And God's will supersedes everybody else's, by the way. All right? And it even should supersede our will. That it's not about me. Praise God I have a resurrected life of Jesus in me. Praise God I'm not going to hell. Amen? That's a praise the Lord there. Praise God my sins are forgiven. Amen? Praise God we have this new life. But it does not stop with you. That's, you're not the end all of the plan of salvation. The world is lost and the world is hurting. Our families are lost and our families are hurting. Our nation needs God again. And it's our responsibility to go tell. Never be ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I love what the Apostle Paul said. I, I sign most of my cards and things like that and birthday cards you ever get from me. It usually has something like... Pastor Joe or just Joe Romans 1 16 for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes that's the word of God that's the power of God's word and think about it you have that power at your disposal to see somebody's life change but you have to share it you share his love you speak his love you live his love before others but it doesn't stop there I think this is all this last point is is so lost all of it just seems to be lost in this culture that we live in and it's lost, this last point is, it's, it's called support his church. It's lost because we're really not interested in others in our world we live in. Today. We're living in a self generation. This culture is geared to self. It's all about you, you know. It, it, it's, it's you first and, and maybe it, they take it and, and r- genuinely, you know, just ruin the Bible when it says wor- verses like, you know, love others more than you love yourself. You know, I mean, said you can't love others as much as you love yourself. We take that verse and we think that means, well, I have to love myself most and best and first. And then I can, you know, I love others. That's not what the verse says. Not, the Bible says before you'd love yourself. In, in spite of all the things that you desire, you love others. In spite of your will, think about others. In spite of what your, what your wish is, think about others. You love others as you love yourself. See, the problem is we love ourselves. Now, the people in the world will say, oh, you don't love yourself enough. That's why you don't love others. No, we love ourselves. I mean, how much time did you take in the mirror this morning? <laughs> how, much time did, 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 how much time do you spend taking care of yourself? How much do you get for yourself? How much do you buy for yourself? How much do you feed yourself? I mean, we don't have a problem loving ourselves. That's not the issue. We don't need lessons and psychologists and psychiatrists writing us books on how to be better self-lovers. All right? We're all wrapped up in ourselves. So what about that person who commits suicide? They're extremely self-lovers. They don't care what other people think. They go ahead and just take their lives without thought for anyone else. So you understand the principle here, folks, is, is that we're not, it's not a lack of love we have for ourselves. We love ourselves. But now with Christ comes in our life, it's no longer about me. It's about God. It's about you. It's about a lost world. It's about the needs of others. It's about the church. In fact, Do you not understand that the Bible teaches that the church itself is the bride of Christ? And think about that for a moment. Jesus, the Bible says Jesus died for the church, right? 
Well, what is the church? We are the bride of Christ. Now, a lot of times people say, well, you know, I don't go to church. I just kind of go to the universal church. That's a popular term, universal church. Well, what is that? And where do you find it? Well, Brother Joe, that's all the Christians in the world. Well, how's that going? Give me a few names. <laughs> how's the fellowship working? Are you using your gifts there? You're not. You use your gifts within the body of Christ. The New Testament. You know, one of the things we talk about in our Journey 101 class, we're describing to people who want to be a part of the church, and, 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 and Gary will make a mention about our, the, the 101 in a moment. But one thing we talk about in our 101 class is that the church is given basically three descriptions in the New Testament. One is called a body, all right? <clears throat> and bodies have parts, members, all right? The church has parts. The church has members. In fact, God gives you, once you come to Christ, a supernatural gift. Not a, not a talent. We're not talking about talents. We're not talking about, well, I can sing or I can play or, I, you know, I'm a great carpenter or I really know my skill and my job. I, I, ha, I have all these abilities. Now, we're talking about natural abilities. We're talking about spiritual gifts that God gave you a spiritual. It's a supernatural thing that God gave you and it functions within the body. You say, well, I don't understand that. Well, I don't understand how my brain works, but all right, it still works. All right. I know you may have questions sometimes, but it does work. I don't understand, you know, how, how the brain can send a message to just autonomically to my heart and it beats again, you know, or how that my eyes blink. I, I don't have to think about that. It just happens. There are parts of the body, it, you know, if I, I need to walk. I don't think about focus each step, getting each step before the other step, you know, getting everything. It's, it's just part of the body. Well, God's gifted you to work within a group of people like that. In fact, there's only about three times in all of the New Testament when it's referring to the church is it talking about all of saved people. All right. Most every instance in the New Testament regarding the church has to do with a local assembly of people who are committed to God and are committed to one another and are committed to reach a world together. That's the church. And then God equips you for that. But catch this. God loves the church. Now, the church is a body. It also says the church is a flock. All right. You know, what's a flock? Well, that's, you know, it's sheep. We're together. We find strength together. We find unity together. We're fed together. We receive together. We work together. We flow together. You know, in fact, it talks about that one sheep that goes up and gets lost somewhere. Had to, had to go out and find it, bring it back to the flock. Why? Because that sheep was never intended to be up on the mountain by itself. There's safety in our numbers. There's accountability. There's protection. There's, there's blessing. There's encouragement in our numbers together. We, we don't walk off and just do our own thing. There, there's, there's no place like that. It's like, it, it's, I, I ran into a guy in an airport one time. And he told me he was a, a professional football player when I asked him what he did. What do you do? I, I'm, I'm a professional ball player. I said, my, wow, who do you play for? I'm not on a team right now. I'm thinking back, well, you're not a professional football player. <laughs> I didn't say that loud. You know how nice I am. <laughs> I didn't say that loud, but well, that's not much of a player, are you? You know, you name on a team. But there's a lot of Christians like that, all right? They like players without the team. God, God didn't call, you know what happens at that point? We become fans and not followers. And he also called, not only are we a body and not only are we a flock, the Bible calls us family. Yeah. Family. We're family. Yeah. We are brothers and sisters. In fact, when you look in the New Testament, it tells us how to relate to each other. It says, treat so-and-so like a mother, treat so-and-so like a sister, treat so-and-so like a brother, treat so-and-so like a father. Remember those passages of scripture? It tells us how to relate in this, this family. You, you need your family. Family needs you. We're all in this together. We can't do this without each other. It's important that we believe God together and stick together and love together and forgive one another. I mean, how many one another's fill the New Testament? Dozens. We need to support the church. God never intended for you to live your Christian life isolated. You say, Brother Joe, I've been really hurt in the church. You know, I got food poisoning one time. Not in church, at a restaurant. I go to restaurants. You know? You ever had food poison? That'll make you sick. That's a joke. Okay, laugh at that. I mean, think about it for a moment. <laughs> it's miserable. I'm just never going back to eat out again. I don't think I'll even eat again. They hurt me so bad. People do hurt people. But that's where Scripture says we learn how to grow together. We learn how to love each other. We learn how to forgive one another. You're not going to find the perfect church. All right? And if you're looking for one, the day you join it, you're going to ruin it because you're not perfect. <laughs> It'll be perfected one day. But I want you to know, in spite of all that, no matter what your opinion is, Jesus loves the church. 
In the book of Ephesians, Paul's writing to the church at Ephesus, giving this great treatise on who they are in Christ, chapter 1. Chapter 2, man, you've been raised as well. You have authority over the demons, and God's moved in your life. This resurrection power that the Holy Spirit's brought in your life is genuine, it's real. And he goes right down, and in chapters 4 and 5, he starts getting real practical with them about you know, their life and their commitments to one another and their jobs and their relationship to their children, your children's relationship to their parents. And he starts talking about men. He says, men, I want you to love your wife. Well, how do I love her? Just like Jesus loves the church. Amen. Christ gave himself for the church. Amen. Jesus is concerned with the church. He says a husband should take the word of God and just wash it over his wife. You share truth with her. Watch your life change. He says the church, Jesus does that for us. Jesus is bringing his word to us and ministering to us and bringing us closer together and uniting our hearts in a common vision, common goal, common purpose. In fact, it's called koinonia in the Greek language. means sharing in a common life. Support your church. God never intended for you to live your Christian life apart from the fellowship of the saints. In fact, the Bible says not to abandon that. Don't, 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 don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. He says it's the manner of some, but don't let it be your manner because it's not God's will for your life. Jesus loves the church. In fact, after he shares that bit about family in Ephesians, he says, I'm talking to you about the great mystery, Jesus Christ and his bride. He's trying to make a point, even in talking about the practical ways of living life. He says, don't forget how important the bride is to Christ. Now, if the bride's important to Jesus, should not it be important to me? Should it not be important to you? I mean, we can think of everything in the world to do on Sundays, but go to church. You know, well, it's the weekend. No, it isn't. This is the first day of the week. <laughs> it's not the weekend. It's the week beginning. Who wants to give Jesus the last day of the week? Jesus deserves first of everything. First in our income, first in our tithe, first in our love. Amen. So he's first. He's foremost. So we give the first day. The Bible says the New Testament saints, they met on the first day of the week. Not the last. Well, you know, we're going to go to the lake. Well, Brother Joe, you know, I'm worshiping God at the lake. You liar. You're fishing. Or skiing. Oh, I'm not going to be at the golf course. I worship God on the golf course. Yeah, but which one? You playing golf at the golf course. I like golf, you know, but I, not a lot of times I spend a lot of time in worship at the golf course. In fact, they're a little repenting about the time I'm done with the golf course. You know, I'm about ready to kill everybody and everything at the golf course. Doesn't always do a lot for my spiritual life. That's why I would never play golf on Sunday, all right? <laughs> Don't ruin it all. This, this is when we come together, folks. If, you, if you're out of church, get back in church. You know, if you've moved and you're looking for a church home, get a church home. Amen? Amen. Come. I mean, you've done everything else. You've got your new address. You reported to the post office. You did all the other stuff. You know, you've got your job, your location. They know where to send your checks, all that good stuff. You need to get in church. You need to be, get back into the fellowship of the saints. You're missing out on the beauty of the God has given to us as his people of each other. There's a beautiful thing there that God has done for us. Don't disregard the church. Don't look for excuses. You know, we think the kids knows us not. We can't even go to church. We're always making excuses of how, why we ought not go to church. Let me say these four things to you again. If you want to experience the reality of Easter, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ in your life, get back right with Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, give your life to Jesus. There's a point where Jesus said you have to come. There's a point of decision. There's a point of choosing Christ over yourself. You surrender to his word. You share what God's done in your life. You share his love with other people, lost people, saved people, all people. And you be involved in what Jesus died to create. Jesus left the church to fulfill the mission. Jesus is not done with the planet just because he died and rose again. He just got started. And it's our responsibility to carry out his will. And we do that with the church. Easter's more. When we come together and celebrate, it's more than just a holiday or a celebration day. It's more than just some kind of religious thing that we go through. It's more than just the story about Christ's death and resurrection. In reality, it is the doorway which we step through to experience the resurrection of God in our own life. We look to what he's done and we celebrate it and embrace it for ourselves. I want you today to really take heart of where you are in your life. I want you today to be encouraged by the word of God. But more than that, I, I really desire and what I have prayed for and others have prayed for over this whole week in preparing for these days is that down deep in your heart, down deep in the soul, down deep in that place where nobody goes but you and God, that you would listen to what God is saying to you there. There was a time in my life that I was so desperate 
and so alone and so empty. I didn't know in my heart and my mind and my life what was going on, going up or going down. I just knew that I was missing something. And it's like an echo chamber down there in my heart. And the, the echo kept coming back this, you need to get right with God. You need to give your heart to Christ. I was religious. I grew up in a religious home. I knew the gospel, but I didn't want God in my life. I'd rejected him. I wanted my will and my way. That's what was first and foremost for me. And it had proven to be an absolute waste of my life to live my life that way. As it always proves itself to be. I kept hearing that. A place where you can't define the word necessarily, but you know what God's saying. A place where you don't hear maybe the audible tones, but you know in your heart. The Bible says the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. And the Lord was speaking down there in my spirit and my soul. And everybody who comes to Jesus nodding your head, you know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And I, when I, on that day, finally gave up and reached out and said, Jesus, I don't even know where to start, but here's my life. I'm sick and tired of living for me. Forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. And you know what? He did. Because he promised he would. He guaranteed it with his own life blood. He sealed it. I didn't need a better church. I didn't need more religion. I just needed God in my life. I needed to experience that Easter resurrection life. And I gave my heart to him. Today, if that's you, I cannot encourage you enough to take heart and to take heed. The Bible says, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't reject what God is saying to you. If you hear his voice, in fact, in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews says, today, if you hear his voice, you know, don't neglect God's word. Don't, don't stray from it. Embrace what the Lord's saying to you today. Some of you may be as I, need to give your life to Jesus Christ. I gave my life to the Lord one night in a rally. It was taking place in an apartment complex. The gospel was being presented. They gave an invitation. Just like we give at our church, we give invitations. Say, if anybody wants to receive Christ, come forward. I came forward that night and gave my life to Jesus. I didn't know what was ahead. I knew what was behind. I didn't want that anymore. I gave my life to Christ. I gave my heart to Jesus Christ. And I chose at that moment to become a follower. If that has not happened in your life, in a moment, we're going to give an invitation. You can come. There'll be men scattered across the front of this altar. Any one of us you can come to. Some are elders, some are pastors, some deacons, but some of our teachers and lift leaders. You can come to anyone and say, listen, I want to give my life to Christ today. What better day to experience that resurrection power than Easter Sunday? Amen. What a testimony of giving your life to Christ on that day. Some of you here, and you're believers, but you know things haven't been right with God. You know you've been... You've been putting him off and putting him second and third and fourth, but he hasn't had first place in your life. I want to encourage you today to come back, experience the resurrection in your life again. Come back to where you know you ought to be in your spiritual walk in life. Come find a place in this altar to pray. You don't need to necessarily come to us unless you just want us to pray for you. You can do that. But you have a high priest. His name is Jesus. The Bible says if we confess our sins, God is faithful and he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I encourage you today to get, get right with God. Some of you today are looking for a church home. You've prayed about it, and the Lord's touched your heart about being a part of Believer's Fellowship. Why don't you come today, obey the Lord? Maybe you're still praying about it. That's fine, but you, ultimately you're going to have to make a decision to go where the Lord is leading you, to do what God is calling you to do, and to be involved. Maybe you just want somebody to pray with you and lift you up to the Lord. We're here to pray for you. Would you stand with your heads bowed for a moment? There's basically just two kinds of folks in this room today. It's the folks who've given their life to Christ and those who haven't. It's that simple. 